titled How Aviation and Innovation Can Help uh, with Terminal Operation Recovery in the Short Term. I'm Vincent Lambert, CEO host today from Fox ATM, and we have uh, four panelists. Um, today from NACO, Yuchu, Zovis, and Ilenium, which are all members of Reboot Aviation. Aviation is obviously much more than terminal operation, but for today we will focus on what happens inside the terminal in terms of check-in, shopping, security, and, and boarding on both sides of the security control, and see how innovation can help us here in the next six months to improve terminal operation. Even if we have lower number of passengers, the COVID changes mean that we could still have bottlenecks. And we have four panelists today uh, to see how innovation from aviation and from other industries uh, can bring us further and help reboot aviation. First, we have Anna from, from NACO. Anna had management roles at both Sydney and uh, San Francisco airports and senior roles in consultancy. And she has more than 20 years of experience in airport terminal planning and operation. NACO being an uh, airport consultancy and engineering firm with overall more than 65 years of experience in aviation and, and air transport industry. Second on the panel is Lee from Uchu Group, a UK-based startup specializing in, in digital products that automate, unify, and deliver simplicity to end users. Personally, Lee has more than 30 years of experience in operational engineering, construction, IT, and innovation role at different airports in the UK and, and overseas. Third on the panel is Megan from Zovis, and she manages uh, the portfolio of US airport customers of Zovis, which includes uh, San Francisco International, Dallas, Fort Worth, LaGuardia, and a few others. And Zovis is coming from facility management and um, queue management and people flow technology. And she will explain us how these things can translate and transport from other fields also into into aviation, Zovis having more than 100,000 sensors installed at facilities worldwide. And last of the panel is Bob from Illenium. Bob is the director for Europe, Middle East and Africa based in Dublin. And he has a background in aviation technology and uh, engineering. And Illenium specializes in creating self-service technology uh, used by millions of people across different industries, not only aviation, but also healthcare government agencies and, and others. So without further ado, Anna, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent, for the introduction and uh, good morning, afternoon and evening to everybody. And thank you for having me here presenting at this webinar. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So uh, NACO uh, conducted extensive interviews of uh, European airports over the last uh, few months two to three months. And we basically identified four major uh, themes during these interviews. Uh, travel demand, the first one, and all the pain that uh, airport operators are feeling at the moment and airlines too, with lots of uncertainty, uncertainty in demand and international travel still highly restricted. Um, we spoke about capacity extensively and the impacts uh, of uh, physical distancing and all the other health screening um, requirements being imposed on airports at the moment. Then we also spoke a lot about all the different health measures and how sometimes uh, they are coordinated across regions, but sometimes are also imposed by single governments in uh, different ways. And we touched on commercial revenues, uh, non aeronautical revenues, and how the lack of passenger numbers obviously is affecting those revenues, but also very creative ways airports uh, and concessionaires are finding to address these uh, concerns. Next slide, please. So, um, Travel advice um, varies a lot, as we are all aware, and not just uh, between countries, but also between regions uh, in these countries, and also depending on which source you're using. This is an example of three sources, a snapshot from last August. Uh, the first one to the left, IATA, in the middle of the Netherlands, where I live, and uh, the European Union. So the situation is very fluid. Um, we hear countries imposing uh, restriction, uh, like overnight and becoming effective in a matter of hours, leaving 
the public and the uh, travelers are uh, stranded. And obviously this is really negatively impacting travel um, all over the world. Next slide, please. So we took a look at uh, all the different mitigation measures um, adapted by the airports we interviewed. And just for illustrative purposes, we have come up with this uh, chart on the right, where we are basically placing these measures according to their effectiveness and to the adoption levels that we observed interviewing these airports. Uh, the effectiveness uh, measures are based on publications by EASA, ECDC, and ACI in their various protocols and guidelines. Uh, some of these measures obviously will be different in different parts of the world. But for now, just uh, as an example, this is what we've got here in Europe. Um, we all want to be in the top right corner uh, where the effectiveness is very high and the adoption levels is also very high. And most of the measures adopted are actually in that quadrant. So communication, fundamentally important to get passengers ready uh, to arrive at the air, respect what they need to do, and also during the boarding and deboarding processes. And that's done by airport signage, online uh, platforms and social medias. Personal protective equipment, uh, such as masks, are often, uh, actually in all cases, we encountered compulsory at airports, lots of hand sanitizer all over the place, and um, also a lot more rotation in terms of terminal disinfection and screening. So, um, that's, that sounds pretty good. And in terms of crowd manage, management measures, which are the pink boxes, uh, basically we see lots of physical distancing being adopted. Uh, all airports are trying their best and with low numbers, still, uh, this is still possible. Obviously there is a question, what are we gonna do when the number starts to increase again? For example, when uh, vaccinations come around or testing become more the norm. Uh, as we go down uh, the uh, adoption level, we can see that uh, HVAC optimization can also be done, but it's difficult in older facilities. Protective screens have been implemented, but not everywhere. And usually uh, protective screens help in um, having adjacent counters still being open and still basically respecting the uh, health protocols. Uh, UVGI applications, especially in trace returns, uh, in uh, uh, baggage, sorry, carry-on uh, screening, um, X-ray machines, uh, and not very much adopted, but uh, increasingly under the attention of lots of our operators, touchless cell service technology. As we move to the left, less effective uh, terminal entry restrictions, um, obviously, um, the guidance is that only traveling, traveling pa uh, public and those that need to be in the terminal should be allowed in the terminal. But some airports told us that because the numbers are so low, still this is not really a problem to maintain social distancing. And um, the, there's a lot of discussion about number 12 at the moment, basically testing. Uh, today, um, or actually in the last few days, we heard a lot of lobbying from IATA and the ACI on uh, basically urging governments to adopt uh, rapid antigen testing um, and to come up with standard protocols that can be deployed everywhere. Um, and so, oh, sorry, we just moved to the next slide. Um, yeah, so I've, I'll go quickly, I know. <laughs> uh, so testing is still in the horizon and as the uh, testing becomes more mature and governments can get together and really understand the protocols, probably it will become more effective than it is today. And then least effective, still a little bit adopt adopted, thermal screening, thermal screening on its own, uh, basically doesn't uh, guarantee that someone has COVID. There are lots of asymptomatic uh, positive cases. And uh, the sanitation cabins and sterilization tunnels have been adopted in some airports, but EASA is not particularly recommending those. And uh, lastly, uh, self-declarations. Uh, lots of airports have, ad have adopted uh, those, but again, uh, it's up to the passenger to self-declare that they have no symptoms. And sometimes, as I said, positive cases are asymptomatic. So, um, as you can see, the situation is very fluid, very uh, different depending on who you talk to. So next slide, please. Uh, so what can uh, operators do, airport operators do in this situation of total uncertainty? Uh, so first of all, our 
recommendation is to really look at scenarios based planning uh, and um, uh, where you basically try different travel demand scenarios as the situation, as I just said before, uh, it's very fluid and changing in terms of recovering different regions and different parts of the world. You've got to run some terminal, uh, sorry, demand scenarios. Look at your capacity in the terminals. Uh, look at what the health measures are doing to your capacity and uh, basically change your protocols or try to uh, adopt, uh, you know, different ways of implementing this measure to avoid bottlenecks, queuing, crowding, and never lose uh, uh, basically track of your commercial revenues. As I said before, there are ways to get around it. And we've seen some really interesting out of the box uh, kind of thinking about that. You need to keep an eye on measuring uh, all these performance, key performance indicators. So we've got the classic measures of throughput, wait times and queuing, uh, but also uh, it's important to look at other measures as I'm sure some of uh, uh, the panelists will refer to and uh, resource uh, allocations uh, on a kind of an hourly base, actually in a very dynamic way where we can basically uh, do proper resource planning and do uh, proper staff planning so that uh, we're not in a situation where we're actually creating additional queues and delays in our terminals. So I mentioned uh, revenues and cost. Uh, all airports are trying to minimize variable costs. That's why it's important to optimize operations so that uh, yeah, staffing is uh, at appropriate levels, but not uh, overly demanding and again on the revenue side of the equations uh, there are ways where airports can look at uh, stimulate some of the uh, non aeronautical revenues we have seen an uptake in food and beverage for example since uh, uh, domestic flying or uh, inter-european flights and start again uh, however there are other things that need to be implemented like uh, touchless uh, uh, solutions, e-commerce platforms that would allow some, some of these revenues to pick up again. Uh, so next slide. Um, we obviously are very aware of all the challenges this crisis has brought to us. Um, the first uh, challenge are the travel restrictions until some of those are lifted and until we deal uh, with uh, some of these restrictions like quarantine, uh, travel will basically not recover internationally. And that's a fact. Um, health measures are confusing at times. So we need uh, more coordination among, among governments. Uh, the industry has been uh, lobbying very hard for uh, governments to really take a look at uh, rapid testing so that we can get our passenger confident and traveling again. Uh, also, we need to be very careful on how we're implementing these new health measures and we don't want to create additional wait times and bottlenecks, sorry, additional basically queuing and bottlenecks all over our terminals. Uh, however, COVID-19 has brought us a lot of uh, opportunities as well. So we have absolutely seen a much, much more attention on touchless technology, on biometrics applications, uh, seamless uh, journey, and on all the technology around uh, uh, real-time passenger flows, understanding exactly where passengers are, what they're doing, where the queues are. And this gives us a tremendous opportunity as an industry to come together and reshape the passenger experience. Next slide, please. And this is my last one, I promise. Um, so this is actually uh, a slide from Fast Future. Um, they conducted a survey of over 250 uh, executives at airports and airlines, and they've asked them, uh, what are your priorities in terms of medium term investments? And as you can see, the very top the majority of the top priorities are all around innovation, digital transformation number one, automation, deployment of AI, and innovation again. So it's all at the very top. So everybody recognizes that, yes, it is expensive, uh, technology is not cheap, but what is the other option? You have to get passenger flying again. You have to give them confidence that uh, airports are safe, traveling is safe, and innovation is certainly going to give a help with that. And with that, I'll uh, give it to Lee. Thank you, Anna, for that presentation. I'm jumping back in again uh, to tell our audience we will have a Q&A session 
at the end after all panelists have held their presentation, but you can already use the Q&A module to send your questions and we will do our best to, to answer them all, uh, but all at once in the end. And before the Q&A question, we will also have a short polling for you about that webinar itself. And now please, Lee, it's up to you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, hi, everyone. So our, plat uh, our platform takes data and provides simple visualization to try and make sense of it. And over some of the following slides, I'll discuss some of the trends that we're seeing uh, as COVID-19 has wrought havoc on the aviation sector and how we might use it to plan for terminal operations in the short term. Obviously, data forms a key pillar to this, <clears throat> and we know that prediction is very difficult in, a, in an environment where the rules are constantly changing, which Anna touched on, and that there's limited historic precedent, and we primarily only have March to go back on. Next slide, please, Vincent. So a little context, a few uh, weeks back, uh, Uchu updated the Reboot Aviation page, uh, www.rebootaviation.com. And we updated it with a new graphical interface with additional data sources. And if you haven't seen it already, the next slide is a really short video just showing, showing the page. So it will zoom in on wherever you connect to in the world. So I'm based in the UK and you can look at airports. So that was just showing Heathrow, it showed arrival and departure flights. You can look at the routes and you can show the impact of that route based on pre and post and current COVID. You can look at uh, flight conditions. You can look at COVID for the airport. You can look at it from a global country perspective and you can pan and zoom um, and, um, and you can apply filters for just airports or countries. As you go through this, I uh, recommend uh, having a little look if you haven't already. So next slide please. So I think these two slides illustrate the scale of the problem and that it, whilst these, this is focused on the UK, it's global, it affects everyone. We've seen airlines cons uh, consolidating to main stations. We've seen British Airways and Virgin consolidating at Heathrow recently. And we've seen some airlines suspended in operations uh, for a period of time, which has some disproportionate impact on some of the airlines and the airports here. But you can see the scale of the challenge that we have. Uh, next slide, please. So I've picked uh, a couple of airports here, um, Heathrow and, and Munich. And, and the uh, COVID um, data for, for Germany and for the UK. So if you, if you look at Heathrow and you look at, at Munich, the start of the year started off relatively uh, the same. And then we saw the massive drop um, during March. The gray line on both of them shows stringency. So stringency is a, a mix of um, uh, indicators which determine uh, how much uh, the, the government constraints that have been applied, uh, financial um, support, etc. And that's applied uh, across uh, every country. So what you can see here is, is that the, the flights have massively dropped off and they're beginning to creep back through July and August. Now September looks a bit lower because it's uh, a part month, we're only halfway through. Um, but also September is typically a quieter month anyway. What we're seeing though from a, sorry, a previous slide, what we're seeing from a COVID perspective is that whilst the numbers are beginning to rise, we're very fortunate not to be seeing mortality levels rise, which is, which is really good. Um, if we look at uh, some airlines, so we've got a couple of flag carriers here and we've got a couple of low costs. Uh, you can see the low costs in these two examples anyway, really paired back operations uh, and in some cases suspended, um, whereas the flag carriers did uh, continue. But what you can see here is while stringency is increasing, both in the UK uh, and in Germany, we've seen flights increase, which is broadly positive. Uh, next slide. And I've got a couple of slides here just showing a uh, country. In both cases, the, uh, 
we've got two continents here, UK and US, and or Europe and US, and you can see the patterns are largely similar. There's more domestic flights that have held up in the US. But what you do see in the in the US is that the pandemic, the COVID spike is much later than in Europe, but we're still seeing flight increasing exactly the same as you were in uh, as you are in Europe. And the next slide, please. Um, and again, here, if you Germany is very similar to to other European countries, but if we picked on Spain as an example, we can see September there's quite a large spike, but at the moment we're not seeing the mortality rate increase. So whilst this is a really complicated and moving picture and we're seeing some real ad hoc sort of unilateral government actions applied really swiftly, something again Anna spoke about, and we're seeing travel uh, restrictions and quarantine change, you know, that, that will obviously impact confidence for, for travellers. However, the, um, the traffic levels do seem to be returning. Now, if this trend continues where we, we see a lower mortality level than we were seeing earlier in this year, and I guess there's lots of different reasons why we might be better prepared now than we were back in March, then it's, it's quite likely that the governments will, will see that as an opportunity to start to soften some of the constraints because of the economic impact it's having uh, on the global, global economy. And we'll see confidence return and we may see um, uh, travellers returning as we approach Christmas of maybe 30 to 40 percent below last year, which is a hugely positive step if we look at um, where we are now. Um, we have data on other regions and countries and airports. If there's anything you want, then, then please let me know. I'll contact you on the last slide. And that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Great. All right, thanks so much everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So Zovis has been in the business of queue management and people counting for the last 12 years. We've been used to delivering wait times and other passenger throughput KPIs to help manage queues. Then obviously the world changed. And as a technology company, we had to decide how to move forward and answer one main question. How are we going to keep airports safe? So we had to switch gears and develop a solution that was going to answer this question. Now in airports, there's a lot of queuing by nature. So you have restrooms, taxi queues, security checkpoints, passport control. All of these areas where people line up makes it really difficult to ensure and monitor physical distancing. Now when talking about short-term recovery goals, tackling physical distancing was one of the first recovery methods. Airports were really quick to put down floor decals, so passengers would adhere to those physical distancing guidelines of six feet or two meters between each traveler. Now, while these quick recovery initiatives have been very helpful, um, data is going to help you. Having accessible real-time data through different technologies like people flow management um, will provide airports with the information that they need to be able to identify high-risk areas and better understand the dynamics of the areas where people are too close. So with our technology, our ceiling-mounted sensors, which are, were originally de um, developed to identify individuals and estimate the queue waiting times, we're now able to identify when passengers in a queue are not in compliance with the physical distancing guidelines that are in place. So here's an example of, here's a map. It's a physical distancing map on the left. Um, it's a general security checkpoint. You can see the high risk areas are represented by the darker colors. Um, the number on the right is actually a Zobis defined KPI, which we have called a PDI, which stands for a physical distancing indicator. This represents the average risk associated with proximity. Basically, the higher the number, the higher the risk of physical distancing being breached. So having access to this real-time view really provides airports with the information um, like if they should widen the stanchions in the queue so that passengers are not too close or when to maybe tell a document checker to hold the line a bit until the congestion decreases at the baggage belt. Um, airports can really use these insights to trigger changes in their queuing procedures or put up additional signage. Um, Using our physical distancing solution, you can also make comparisons. So here we have an airport where on the left, 
Um, this was before they had practiced any social distancing initiatives. Um, you can see that the PDI is 2.7. You can see the darker areas representing those high risk where people are too close. The after is when they actually put floor decals down. So you can see the PDI has decreased and the areas where there's high risk has also decreased. So using this kind of technology, you can determine whether your initiatives are successful or not. Um, one of our uh, US airport customers, they've been utilizing our physical distancing solution. And one thing they've actually found is that passengers will social distance on their own during periods of low activity. However, when it's busy and congested, they're less likely to social distance. So with, this, with the insight into these trends, they've learned to expect to see higher PDI values during periods of high passenger volume. Now, human behavior is very tricky. It's tricky to predict, it's tricky to manage. But with this information, you'll be able to make uh, better and more knowledgeable business decisions. Now, a common concern that I've heard from a lot of my customers is capacity. So if traffic numbers were to return anywhere close to what they were pre-COVID, and if the physical distancing guidelines stay in place, the queue lines will be out the main doors of the terminal into the parking garages. Um, now, some airports are lucky in that they have designated overflow areas um, you know, for check-in, for security, for passport control. But this isn't common. Airports weren't, to, weren't designed to accommodate this. Um, according to a recent study by Eurocontrol, I thought this was interesting. Now, they mentioned that the provision of space is critical if these guidelines for physical dis distancing stay. Um, so let's just take a look at what they discovered. So for the same passenger numbers in a pre-COVID queue, 50% more space is required at check-in, 100%, 100% more space at security, and then 35 to 50% more space at boarding gates. So one way to help with this lack of space is this idea of virtual queuing. So the concept is that the individual can either reserve a specific time slot similar to a reservation prior to arriving to the airport, or they can scan a QR code upon entrance to the airport. Um, then they're free to either go grab a coffee, do a little shopping pre-security, and then they'll be notified when it's their turn to join the queue. The idea behind this is that you're controlling and limiting the number of passengers in the specific queuing area. Lastly, passengers really just wanna feel a sense of confidence that when they travel, they'll not, they're not gonna be at risk of exposure. So we've already seen the increase um, in sanitation practices, the PPE vending machines, the social distancing. Another way to instill confidence is through using technology for face mask detection. So this type of technology can be used in many different um, areas. So it can be used upon entrance into a screening area. If the traveler is not wearing a mask, possibly an e-gate integration um, could deny them entrance. It's a little video here just showing our technology. One way um, to also instill confidence is showing statistics to travelers through signage or through a mobile app or airport website. So this can be a really powerful tool. So basically what you're showing them is that the airport is dedicated to their health and well-being, and you're utilizing sp specific technology to keep them safe. Um, I think you know 2020 and beyond, there's gonna be a movement, and we've already seen it, of travel, health, and wellness, and technology will really be on the forefront of this. And that's it for me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Megan. I think I'm up next, but I'm not sure if we've lost uh, lost oh, control. You are, Bob, uh, please. I'm in control. Ah, brilliant. I, I lost you for a second, my mistake. Okay. I, uh, am I in control? Here we go. Um, I'll uh, request control then, uh, Vincent. So hi, everyone. Thanks very much for, uh, for attending the, uh, the webinar. I've got a list of attendees in front of me, so nice to see some, uh, some familiar faces, or at least familiar names, uh, to, uh, to join us on the call. 
Um, I guess, uh, let me see if I can navigate, there we go. So, you know, what we looked at on uh, in Linium in terms of how we, how we help restart aviation was what's really preventing passengers from, from traveling and what's keeping the numbers down and the, the demand low. And I guess, you know, from all of our own personal experience, you know, we don't want to get on a flight if you have to quarantine for, for 10 or, or 14 days, or we don't want to travel if we don't know what the situation will be when we arrive or um, what restrictions might be there when, uh, when we return. Um, and, you know, you can see a lot of governments uh, being lobbied by the aviation industry to implement some sort of testing or screening uh, within the airport. So clearly, um, there's, a, there's a big push in that area, and that's something that, that will give passengers and I think governments themselves a, a high degree of confidence in, um, in increasing the number of, uh, of passengers who will, will restart to travel. The other area that's, that's much talked about is, uh, is touchless technology and removing the need for, for passengers to physically touch things like screens for um, check-in and bag drop information, kiosks uh, and that sort of thing. So big push on touchless. And obviously we're, we're seeing a lot and um, we saw it in, Me in uh, Megan's presentation about social distancing and the importance of that. And again, sanitization is a big element. And there's a survey done recently by IATA and you can see these points are, are really highlighted in terms of what will give passengers a great degree of comfort. You know, the biggest one of all is, uh, is screening there's lots in there about uh, social distancing and, and, uh, and wearing masks. Temperature checking is, is much talked about and I'll, I'll cover that a little bit in the presentation. And again, touchless is another area that, um, that we're seeing a, a big demand from the industry. Uh, so I'll cover off these, these few points in the, in the next couple of slides. Um, if I can figure out how to navigate, there we go. So, you know, again, going back to, uh, to testing and screening, it's, it's a great idea to, to test everyone uh, when they get into the airport, but the logistics of that are, are very difficult. It's slow and it's expensive to, to test people. Uh, the testing has various degrees of accuracy um, and the rapid tests generally are seen as being, uh, I guess, not as accurate or as reliable as the, the more reliable swab tests. And the other issue with testing is if you've contracted COVID just before you got to the airport, uh, for example, then it won't show up on the test, which is why you have these, these long periods of, uh, of quarantine. The other aspect as well is, is what you do with all of these people who are being tested uh, as they go through the airport. Where do, you where do people wait for the results of their test? Um, and this is an issue for both uh, departing passengers and, uh, and arriving passengers. And there are conversations too around some kind of health passport and you could get a test done prior to getting to the airport and that can be verified in the airport using technology. Uh, but again, there's a lot of complexities to be worked out until we can have um, you know, really a reliable procedure around, uh, around testing. And we've talked about te temperature checks as well. Uh, and the industry is, has played around with doing various forms of temperature checks using uh, cameras to screen masses of people as they, they go through the airport. And again, the results from there are, are quite mixed. So looking at the, the capabilities that, uh, that we have in Linium, but also the capabilities that exist in the industry, we've kind of put together some scenarios in terms of how could we maybe take more of a layered approach to, uh, to adopting screening and testing in the airport. You know, and this is similar to how we do security screening today. Uh, you may recall after 9-11, there's been a, a huge push in, um, in safety and, and uh, security screening at airports. And you very much take a layered approach. You do a light touch on all the passengers and then on passengers that are, that are identified as being high risk, then you do an additional layer of screening. And then for those passengers who are identified as being particularly high risk, then you can do testing. So, so in this scenario, looking at people's health, you could, for example, do an accurate measurement of people's temperature uh, throughout the journey um, when they arrive, when they depart, or when they are transfer passengers. So perhaps passengers with, uh, that are showing maybe an elevated temperature, then you could take those passengers and do a greater level of screening. So for example, using technology, you can accurately measure the temperature, but also look at their heart rate and respiratory rate. And using these vital signs, it gives you a really high level of indication if someone could have COVID-19. And then additionally, with these particular passengers, you could ask questions about where they've been, have they had a COVID uh, vaccine, and you can ask questions about symptoms such as a, um, 
a dry cough or a, a loss of taste. Um, you can also apply that level of screening perhaps from passengers who come from particular hotspots, maybe red or amber countries, for example, and you don't necessarily need to apply this screening for arrivals from, from green countries. And then using that layer of screening, you can then identify which passengers you want to actually test. Uh, so rather than testing everyone, you narrow down the list of the people who are highest risk. And then looking at those high risk passengers, you can then use your valuable screening resources and your testing resources to, uh, to test those passengers. And again, it could be passengers identified as being at risk from the screening technology or you may want to, for example, test all passengers that are coming from a, from a very high risk location. But by applying these, screening these layers of screening and the, uh, and the technology, you could instill that level of, of confidence and also give governments the confidence that the airports are doing what's necessary to reduce the spread of, of COVID. Just to touch on, on the screening technology itself, there's, there's been a lot in the media about the accuracy of, uh, of temperature checks and, and uh, airports have done various studies and uh, often they've shown the, the temperature checks to be, to be fairly ineffective. And the reason for that is that when you have an elevated temperature, when you have a febrile temperature that shows that you, you might, have, uh, might be sick, it exhibits on, a, on very specific areas of your head. So using a low resolution camera or using a, a crowd screening solution, really you just measure the temperature of people's heads. Uh, which doesn't give an indication if they, they could have a te high temperature or not. You really need to have a high resolution camera that will look at the specific areas of the face to see if, uh, if they could have a high temperature. And, you know, like everything else in an airport, you can't just buy things off the shelf and, and hope that they will work. The technology that if we're serious about screening passengers using technology, we need to make sure that the technology that's being deployed has been certified by industry organizations. It's been approved by ISO, by government health organizations, et cetera, and not just be putting in off the shelf technology. And also when we think about screening, um, you know, it's not just temperature screening, it's also heart rate and respiratory rate and screening for all the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, it could just be a, a loss of taste, or, or a dry cough, and that's enough of an indicator to, uh, to bring people in for, um, for more detailed testing and see if they have, could have COVID or not. So, you know, in conclusion, um, let's all hope we get a, a vaccine uh, soon. All, all signs and all accounts will be that we'll be living with this, uh, this situation for, for months, if not uh, a good part of the year. So in the meantime, what do we do and, and how do we get the, uh, the curves that Lee has shown? How do we get those curves lifting back up? And certainly one of the ways to do that is to implement a levels of screening. We can do this today. The technology exists to, uh, to filter down the people who could be at risk. And the technology exists to do fairly rapid uh, testing in airports. And this is one way that we see that um, by taking a layered approach to health screening, we can open up uh, air travel and, uh, and get people flying again. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you, Vincent. And I'll try to give uh, control back. There we go. Yes, thank you, Bob. Thank you for, for, for that presentation and thanks to, to all panelists. Uh, before we go into the Q&A session, I will launch the poll about uh, the webinar itself. So you can give us as attendees, uh, your feedback and your feelings about uh, the, the quality of the webinar. Um, so you have a few seconds for that. My personal takeaway from what we've heard today is that uh, on one side, technology can offer a lot of, of solutions from different aspects, from different industries, uh, but there is no single solution. The reality will probably be uh, a mixture of different products, different technologies, and it's not only about managing and, and measuring and, and data will help, but it's also about reinstalling confidence into travel. It's not only about the efficiency of the measures, but it's also about the, the feeling of uh, the passengers and how they will feel and, and be safe again uh, flying. Okay, we have votes coming in from the poll, but I will leave it running still for, for a few minutes. Um, and go into the Q&A. I think the first question is, is going to Anna. And 
relates to the table you presented with the effectiveness of the different measures. And that, that's why can, quite an interesting question. How do you define effective in that context? What is an effective measure? And how do you define effectiveness? Anna? Thank you, Vincent. Uh, yes, it's a very good question. Uh, so there are different ways uh, that uh, we measure effectiveness, I guess, or we define effectiveness. So it could be minimizing the risk of transmission. So that's uh, the cleaning protocols, implementing the HVAC system, upgrades, uh, those sorts of measures. Um, effectiveness could also be about detecting the virus, the presence of the virus in a person. And so that those measures could deal with, you know, testing or the thermal screening or is in effectiveness in this case uh, on its own. Um, and um, um, also effectiveness could be about information. So communication to passengers to inform them of what they need to do, uh, hygiene um, kind of measures, but also you know, what, what they have to expect when they arrive at the airport, the wearing of the mask, so that they are prepared and they are compliant. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. The, the second question was raised during uh, Lee's presentation, but it's quite general. So if, if someone else wants to pick it up, because it's a hard one, um, given the current increase of new COVID cases in various countries, UK, Spain, Germany, Italy, and France, what could be the possible impacts to the airports industries in terms of travel restrictions? Lee, please. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge dilemma, I think. Um, I think as I was outlining before, whilst we, we're seeing those cases rise, and they have been rising over the last few days, it's a very um, near-term phenomenon, is that we're, we're not seeing the, uh, the deaths increase um, to the same level that we saw back in March. And I'm sure there's a whole sort of gamut of reasons behind that. I think the challenge for government now is, is it's much more focused on the economic impact than it perhaps may have been um, earlier in the year. And it understands that, that, that locking down and applying restrictions everywhere is, is, is unaffordable and is, is, is in danger of bank bankrupting uh, the globe if we're not careful. So I think, I think if, if there, there, will, there will certainly be um, some, some impact to confident, confidence for sure for, for travellers. But I think if, if, the, um, if we don't see an increase in, in the level of, of people dying from COVID over the coming few weeks, then governments will feel uh, they'll, they'll, they'll less need to be on the, on the side of caution and maybe will allow um, uh, to, to lessen uh, quarantines. I read in the paper this morning about some quarantines reducing to seven days and perhaps we'll see that across Europe. Thank I'm not you, sure Lee. if anyone else wanted to... Any other comments from the uh, panel? Okay, then we'll move to the next questions. Uh, one was specifically to Megan. Uh, what is your take on drop-off points outside terminal airports? Could it help and make queues more manageable? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think definitely, um, you know, any opportunity to, you know, have travelers do a lot of their kind of passenger or procedures outside, outside of the, the terminal is great. I think, you know, when you talk about curbside check-in, I think they're great for families. Um, I think they, you know, were quite prominent many years ago before we had this self kind of service check in which that took over and I think people are more inclined to want to use that or, or go inside to the airport, but um, I think they could definitely help and I think, um, you know, when it comes down to, you know, handling check in I think that's a, a really good uh, use case but then you get to you know, security and going through the security checkpoint. So I think, you know, that will definitely help check in, but then everyone has to has to go through uh, the screening area. So that's still kind of a, an area that, you know, we need, we need help with to, to manage. Thank you, Megan. Uh, the next question will be for Bob. Uh, you mentioned that temperature checks are not so expect, sorry, effective and, and you 
went briefly into vital sign checking. Uh, what is it, what do you suggest here and, and can it be more effective than uh, temperature checks? Yeah, yeah, thanks Vincent. Yeah, I guess, you know, there's been a lot in the media about the, uh, the accuracy and the value of temperature checks. And what we've seen is by using the handheld scanner gun and pointing at someone's face, uh, you really don't get an accurate measurement of, uh, of people's temperature. And, uh, and in Alenium, we've spent um, a lot of time and resource in trying to understand how to, to measure people's temperature accurately. And, uh, and we've developed the technology, and, and we're not the only ones who've developed the technology that can be as accurate as the, the sort of industry standard in the earth thermometer. So that's the first element is, is the, the getting the accuracy of the measurement. The other thing is studies have shown that uh, in detecting uh, symptoms of illness, Temperature alone is about 40% uh, accurate in predicting an illness. Whereas if you add in temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate, you get about a 90% prediction if someone could be sick or not. So that's why I, uh, we, we encourage not just to, to look at the temperature checking, but also checking of other vital signs, such as heart rate and respiratory rate, and to do that in a, in a non-contact, uh, touchless, and automated way. Okay, thank you, Bob, for, for that. We have another question, which is quite interesting, but not addressed to a specific panelist. Uh, what about younger passengers, children, teenagers, which probably need a different kind of uh, solutions and, and processing here? Anybody? I mean, I'll just throw out a comment as I'm, as I'm the only one who's not muted. Um, you know, I guess it depends on, on uh, from the technology point of view, you know, once kids go above a certain age, they, they're the same size more or less as, uh, as adults and um, below a certain age, certainly I've got, uh, I've got school going kids and, and the general view is that, that kids can't transmit the virus uh, between themselves. So I, I think the answer on kids and, and the answer also in, in terms of the, uh, you know, maybe the earlier question with the spike in, in um, in cases in certain countries in Europe is, you know, we do need uh, industry-wide uh, guidance and decision. It's extremely difficult for each airport on their own to make a decision, for example, on how to, how to deal with a child, at what age are you no longer a child, how should they be processed differently? And, uh, and at a certain point, we do need an industry-wide um, collaboration and guidance on, on how to deal with, with these sorts of issues and questions. And sorry, can I add to that? That's a very good point, Bob. Um, yes, uh, the industry collaboration is the key here, uh, not just for young travelers, but uh, for pretty much everything. And that's why uh, industry organizations such as IAT and ACI have tried really hard in the last uh, even few days and few weeks to get the industry to work together. And ICAO has done also a tremendous job in uh, trying to have these discussions with governments so that there is an increased emphasis on uh, uh, protocols, standardized protocols that are adopted everywhere and that will therefore avoid some of these very stringent travel restrictions. Thank you, Anna. Um, there is one more question coming in to you. Uh, you referred uh, biometrics and touchless as an opportunity and uh, something that can help with COVID mitigation. But the people asking the question say uh, they've seen seamless travel and they still see queues. So do you really think uh, biometric and touchless can, touchless can help in COVID and really reduce queues? Uh, so, um, Yes, I did mention uh, biometrics and touchless. Uh, touchless is definitely the first step uh, towards avoiding um, basically the spreading of, uh, of the virus. But biometrics uh, uh, really pushed uh, to its maximum capabilities, uh, which means also incorporating um, you know, digital um, understanding or digital record of passport and immunization. And it's something that is very much debated also uh, on the privacy level. But there are, there's a lot of uh, discussion also on how this information can be the hands of the travelers and only shared with uh, 
whether they're interacting at that specific touch point on a uh, kind of, um, you know, is a choice that the passengers will make about what information to share and when. Uh, but basically by enabling the passengers to um, just have this information digitally available and digitally shared, you can envision a, a journey through uh, processing points that is basically uh, touchless, completely touchless, and just uh, using your face, for example, as uh, your identity. Um, and the other thing that this kind of uh, technology does uh, has been proven by all the testing done uh, all over the world in, in various airports all over the world, that the processing is faster, the queues are uh, smaller, and in some cases, um, touch points can be combined. So there are fewer touch points, for example, emigration and boarding, um, or uh, you know, kiosks, checking kiosks will not be uh, no longer required in such an extensive deployment, uh, checking counters. So again, technology that will reduce the number of touch points, uh, the few that are remain will be touchless in a way where information can be combined and digitalized and be in the hands of the passenger himself or herself to share when needed. So there's a lot of work to be done. We're not there yet by any means, but um, I think there is a big push now within uh, uh, regulators and uh, airports, airlines to make this happen as soon as possible. Thank you, Anna. Um, the next question is for Megan. Uh, you mentioned how you can measure social distancing. Uh, the question is about knowing if you can give some examples from your experience at airports you work with, uh, what the measures are or what measures can be put in place to improve social distancing. Sure, so yeah, just one example. Um, one of our customers, what they're actually doing is with the PDI, um, what they've done is they've set a threshold. So, um, you know, when the PDI hits a certain number, um, a notification actually goes out. And we have a, a good working, this airport has a good working relationship with the TSA. So the TSA supervisor is actually getting a notification as well as one of the terminal operations supervisors. So when the PDI hits that number, they're actually being um, sent out to the floor to kind of mitigate the issues. Um, another way it can help, again, is, is with queue layout. So looking and determining, um, you know, if the, the stanchions need to move, um, that's just, you know, one example. Um, but really it's, you know, it's about having that insight and, and, you know, if you need to either set up notifications or alarms or change the, the layouts can be really helpful there. Thank you, Megan. Next question is specifically addressed to Bob. Um, aviation is not the only transportation industry that needs hash reboots. Um, what can aviation learn from other transportation modes or is other tra other, are there other transportation modes that can learn from aviation? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Florian. I mean, it's funny, my, my background is in, in aviation and uh, recently because of uh, Alim's development of the technology for, for the health check, I've kind of gotten out of the aviation sector to an extent. So talking to other transportation um, providers and uh, organizations and also just industry in general. Um, and that question I get asked a lot. I think, you know, what's, what's um, kind of unique about aviation in terms of, of passenger flow is the volume of people that you get uh, flowing through an airport or a particular space at, at a point in time. There's no other real parallel. So like an entrance to a shopping mall or an entrance to a hospital, uh, for example, you never get that same flow rate. Arguably, you get a similar, uh, similar flow rate with, with rail. Um, rail is a little bit different because you get a, a much higher transaction volume, whereas people who, who travel on, the, um, on a flight generally you spend more time going through the, the individual touch points. Uh, but certainly I think on um, you know, the technology such as a touchless uh, technology and any kind of health screening that we can do as part of the passenger journey could very much be applicable to things like uh, shopping malls, but also sports stadiums. The, uh, the sporting industry and the event industry in general are also really struggling. And, and typically those industries don't have access to the technology that we do here. So I do see um, a uh, room for us to take the lessons that we learn here in terms of applying things like touchless and, and health checking technology in aviation 
and applying that to things like events, uh, such as sporting events or concerts and, and that sort of thing. Thank you, Bob. Um, the next question is about the rapid antigen tests and their link to the lack of confidence that we have. Could antigen tests be really the solution to increase passengers' confidence and agreements between countries to trust each other? Does someone want to go on that? Yeah, I can try. And I know that Bob had a whole slide on uh, testing, so maybe he also wants to add to it. But uh, yeah, so the, uh, basically the position of ACI and IATA is to support uh, antigen testing as uh, the way to go, rapid antigen testing as the way to go. And uh, uh, recently they wrote to the European Commission and uh, to independently to uh, other states to basically adopt this as the new standard for testing. Uh, some airports have already started it. Uh, I think there were trials uh, uh, on some flights and at Milan Malpensa and Fiumicino airports in Italy. So um, the problem with this test at the moment is that, as Bob said before, it's not uh, very well it's not uh, uh, super accurate so there are still cases where the passenger is not showing uh, any of the um, anti-agents uh, or agents presence uh, uh, for this virus to be detected even though they will become uh, let's say COVID positive. So, and I'm not a, an health expert as you can tell but uh, reading the literature and uh, talking to people in the industry and yeah, just listening to what's going on out there, countries are still not on board uh, with antigen testing, but hopefully uh, the view is that they will as testing continues to improve. Thank you, Anna. Um, we are close to the end, but I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we have one for, for Megan about the mask detection feature you've shown in the video. And it's, it's a bit multifaceted question. Does that imply facial recognition with all the possible privacy aspects of it? And second, uh, how can you enforce it in reality? I mean, you, you detect someone has no mask, what, what do you do next? Yeah, uh, good question. So our face mask detection does not require facial recognition. So it's um, our AI firmware, which actually mimics the human eye. Um, so it's we've trained the AI to visually distinguish if an individual is wearing a face mask or not. So it's more about the properties of the mask, the shape, where it is on the, the face. Um, as for enforcing it, yeah, it's tough. I mean, um, you know, the face mask detection and enforcement is only as successful as you make it. So, um, you know, I think it's tricky here, especially in the States, you know, many people can choose not to wear a mask. And if they have certain ailments that prevent them from wearing, from wearing ones, it's very difficult to enforce. Um, but I think it goes back to human behavior. I think the majority of us tend to wanna to follow the rules. Um, and in a space like an airport where I think everyone really you know, primarily wants to be safe, as safe as possible. And I think most of them are, are following suit. So if others are wearing masks, you know, they'll typically also wear one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to enforce, definitely. Thank you, Megan. Um, so we've got the results of the polls coming in now. Um, so just looking at that, we have between 25% uh, judging the webinar excellent and 58 judging it good. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, it has been recorded, so the recording will be available. You will all receive a link in the end. Uh, we will do our best to answer the, the still open questions. Uh, but I want to thank all the participants today uh, for your presentation and uh, for answering and taking time to interact with, with everybody. I encourage you to check Reboot Aviation online uh, on the website and on LinkedIn. Um, so if someone wants to add a some last words, please. Otherwise, we're on time. So thank you, everybody. And uh, hopefully see you soon for our next Reboot Aviation webinar. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.